It's right up the list, 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 Funded entirely through the generous sleeve of our Patreon backers. Patreon.com forward slash Rightopolis Podcast. Right up the list, right up the list, right up the list, we're not just gonna kid it. Right up the list, right up the list, right up the list, we're not just gonna kid it. Yeah. Looks like the backup bot's recording as well, so hopefully if one drops out, we'll be okay. It's brilliant, so should I do the intro? Please. Yeah, um, welcome everybody to Rightopolis. Um, we've had a, a minimum of trouble so far, which is quite quite very different to when Mark was with us last time. I'd have um, to describe that as ominous, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, terrifying. Um, and um, we're here with the wonderful Stephen Book, and I will let Kit tell you about Stephen Book. Indeed. So, am I saying it right? First of all, yes, that's right. Yes, and 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 Stephen Book is a, a screenwriter. And novelist, award-winning uh, in both fields, I have to say. Uh, you may remember him from Ken Russell movie Gothic. You may remember him from Ghostwatch, or you may remember him from his f- fantastic uh, fiction prose work, including the Dark Masters trilogy, which is uh, Whitstable, Leighton Stone, and I'm blanking on the last one. Nether- Netherwood was it called? Is that right, Stephen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, which I blanked, are just I blanked it in myself then for a minute. So, uh, <laughs> oh, that's t- uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> don't, don't feel too bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, go on. I, I just put up a picture of, of a building in the chat that you can see. Because um, I think I, I need my long standing um, resentment of Stephen Falk out the way first. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did. I did warn Stephen that this might come up. So, <laughs> you see, that building there is called Meanwood Towers, um, and it's absolutely terrifying. It's a, a late Victorian Gothic monstrosity. It's even more horror movie inside. And um, I watched Ghost Watch with my then girlfriend, <laughs> and we were looking after a bed set in that building for a friend of ours. And I have never been so terrified in my entire life, Stephen. <laughs> oh, we did not sleep all night. And, and, and I just, I, I've never forgotten that program. So it is an honour to have you here. Even though I, I, <laughs> Well, I, I never know when people say that kind of thing, I never know whether to say thank you very much or I'm deeply sorry. So uh, well, it's, a bit, mean, it's a bit of both. We did stay up all night, but not for the reasons we expected. So... <laughs> <laughs> so look the place with the pipe organ yes it is the place with the pipe organ um the the man who built me would house built it specifically so his wife would have somewhere to play a pipe organ the wow. pipes was in the building <laughs> <laughs> that will have added to the atmosphere a bit i imagine yeah, uh, it, it's it's a, a crazy, spooky place. But anyway, I've I've got that out the way now, so we can just talk about other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can Scott, just uh, you can just quiver away, uh, weeping in the corner, uh, while the rest uh, of us get on with the interview. And, <laughs> and remember, I can still hear the sound of the wind blowing through the studio at the end. <laughs> that is, it's just welded into my head, and I just thought it was a brilliant ruffling Michael Parkinson's wig. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, of course, a wig. It's a. It's, it's merely. It's merely a quite an aged beetle cut. <laughs> it's merely perfectly quaffed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case Parky's lawyers are listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think they would have been on before now. Yeah. That's- <laughs> Seems likely, doesn't it? Seems likely. But actually, um, um, kind of jumping jumping ahead, I don't know if you want to discuss Ghost Watch, but the funny thing, well, curious thing about Parky was that um, there couldn't have been anyone more um, in defense of what he'd done um, mm. than he was. I mean, he completely, first of all, he completely got it. 
Uh, he read it. He, he kind of got what we're about. Dad, I want to do this. I get what you're doing. You know, he used to he used to present cinema, a program about movies. So he knew what um, you know movie iconography was and uh, genre mm. and that kind of thing. So he's no he's no uh, dope in that regard. So he got what we were trying to do. He he thought it was fun to be in it and. And when the shit hit the fan, as as we all know it did on uh, uh, October 31st, or rather the, the next morning, um, you know, that he was doorstopped by the press. But he said, you know, basically, don't be daft. What the hell are you talking about? Of course it, of course it was fiction, you know. Anyone, you know, he said, what do you expect? People believe the wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> that was his, that was his uh, attitude, you know. People believe the wrestling's real. What do you expect? <laughs> Um, which I thought was rather good, but it was co- it was co- also quite good that um, when Private Eye did a review of Ghost Watch, they um, the headline was a parky normal experience, nice. <laughs> which was uh, priceless, worth worth <laughs> worth all the slog of getting the program on just for that one thing. I think. Do you think you could do something like Ghost Watch now, or, or do you think it would be kind of pre-spoiled by the internet? I think it would be. Impossible to do it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the nearest uh, the lovely guys from Inside Number Nine did something beautifully similar recently with their live broadcast on Halloween. Um, I was delighted with that, but of course they accommodated the live tweeting and that kind of thing into the mm-hmm. program, which they did brilliantly. Um, but people quite often say, "Would you do it now? Would you?" Um, you know, it'd be very difficult. To, I mean, it was difficult then to stop the cat being out of the bag. But, I mean, now mm. you'd – I don't know how you'd kind of get around that. I mean, it would be instantly received as misinformation or, or um, treated with skepticism and that kind of thing. Um, you know, in the age of fake news, it kind of almost predated fake news by, like, 30 years, you know, <laughs> in a way. Um but uh, also people kind of say, well, would you do it again? How would you do it now? And I say, listen, it's not – you know, that was 1992, for God's sake. You know, I did it then. And I, you know, hand on heart, um, I think if, if someone's going to do it now, well, they wouldn't do it. But what they would do that takes the audience by surprise in whatever medium in a similar kind of way um, uh, would be something I wouldn't be expecting. That's how I see it. You know, it would right. be someone else surprising me. Um, uh and funnily enough, I said that in an interview with um, uh, Jed, Shep- Jed Shepard um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and he said he was working on something that was very influenced by Ghostwatch. Uh, and I said, well, you should be the one that, that does it then. And he said, oh, OK, then. And uh, he went on to um, make Host, hmm. you know, the, um, the Zoom call horror that came right. out. You know, and was a fantastic success last year, which I thought was. Um, and then he reminded me. Do you remember saying that in that interview? <laughs> I said I don't remember saying that. And he said, "Well, that's what made me really want to do it. The fact that you oh, said somebody else is going to do a no, new Ghost Watch, and that's what made them do it." You know, so I was doubly thrilled when it was a huge success. Uh, it's funny you're talking about that. The other thing that I immediately thought of was the the publicity campaign around the Blair Witch Project, which kind of mm. was very early internet, but it very much utilised that notion of of it being a real thing, the found footage and the way it was the way it was publicised. Now, of course, uh, you know I think probably most people going to the cinema to see it did know it was a movie and not and not a found you know wasn't genuine in that sense. But but. I remember that early word of mouth was quite impressive because they set up like well, I, think um, the, fake... I think the um, pre-publicity in a way was as much, well, probably more work of genius than the film itself, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> so mm. it's kind of like the hype. <laughs> but that's there's a kind of long tradition of that in horror, isn't there? I mean, I've you know, I've, God forbid, I haven't written a thesis about it, but you know, when you think of um, you know, publicity, that you know, William Castle when he did. What was it, The Tingler or something like that? It was, it was mm-hmm. you know, horror films have kind of thrived on pre-publicity, haven't they? In yeah. that kind of hucksterish, kind of like freak show sense, roll up, <laughs> roll up. You know, this is what you're going to get when you go behind, you pull the curtain away and go into the darkened room, kind of thing. So there's um, there's that invitation that is part of horror, I think. Um, uh, yeah. You know, it's horror is a funny genre because I think, un- unlike every other genre. Every other genre offers you pleasure, but horror actually 
doesn't offer you pleasure. It kind of dares you to confront what it's going to give you. So it's kind of the inverse of pleasure. And I think that's what makes it so kind of special and intriguing as a as a craft, because you, um, you're ultimately kind of trying to win people over something that they physically and kind of met- metaphysically don't want to go there. I mean, <laughs> you don't have a metaphysical or physical resistance to comedy, say. Everyone wants to laugh. All right. But, <laughs> you know, and they go to an action film. You all want to be thrilled, but there's a there's a the negativity of emotion that draws people into horror that makes it very peculiar to itself. I think <laughs> that's really interesting. And you, you know, when you're talking about the the publicity and that freak show thing and the, the Huck, I was thinking of um, you know, thinking of like the the black and white you know, the hammer, not hammer, sorry, the, the original black and white Frankenstein, you know, the universal Frankenstein, which actually has someone standing on stage saying, hey, this one's oh, yeah. really scary, guys. You might not enjoy this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I also think about Hitchcock doing that thing with, I think it was Psycho, wasn't it, where he said, we're going to lock the doors. Like, you're not allowed to be oh, admi- yeah, admitted yeah, yeah, after yeah, the yeah. first 20 minutes or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then you have, the cheesy, you have the cheesy um, gizmos like the werewolf break, in uh, the beast must die, you know, right? <laughs> where where you have a werewolf break to to try and ponder who who's actually the werewolf. You know? <laughs> that was the most, that was the most absurd um, concoction ever, but quite kind of funny. Wasn't there one recently when they said someone had died? Fear in the cinema. Well, I think that's quite a regular thing. I mean, there was a lot of. <laughs> it's not just kind of B movies that happen. There's a lot of. Um, hype whipped up around the exorcist i mean some of it truthful and newsworthy but to be honest i think friedkin and co also whipped up a kind of atmosphere around the film of you know dark forces at work and that kind of thing i'm not saying they said that they were in touch with evil forces and that kind of thing but they didn't if people if people expressed that view the publicity department didn't kind of show them the door put them put it like that um, so there was something. There was something about the idea that kind of bad stories attract, uh, you know, made that kind of film um, a little more kind of like um, uh, attractive to the audience mm. that they were after, really. So it did no. It kind of did no harm. Hmm. You know, I've never seen The Exorcist. I've read the book, but I've not seen the film. I'm probably too scared as well now. I'm such a wuss. I, I made the mistake. I saw it. I do like the film very much, but I made the mistake. I saw it when I was in college, and I went with uh, uh, one of my friends at the time who was Chinese, and he I only say that apropos nothing, really, except for the fact that he was, came from a cultural different background. He just thought it was hilarious and, and laughed <laughs> all the way through it. He came out and said, you didn't think that was good, did you? And I, I kind of did, but but because he was so dismissive of it, I didn't really see see the um, the brilliance of it for many years afterwards. Really, I, mm. I think he thought that pea soup and everything was very kind of like uh, over the top, really. So, um, in the face of you know thousands of people kind of being physically ill and shocked and fainting and everything across the United States, it it wasn't easy to have the same effect when someone next to you is kind of guffawing at every uh, <laughs> return in the plot, really. But so subjective, isn't it? So subjective. And I actually think the experience of going to a cinema and uh, how you receive a film is the actual moment that you watch a film is affected by so many things beyond the film itself. You know, what mood you're in before you go. The, certainly the expectation when you go because you can over expect a film to deliver something um, and you can be you can be hugely disappointed um, and it seems to me sometimes that Hollywood doesn't care as long as you pay your ten dollars to get in and see it they don't really care whether, you, whether you're disappointed when you come out because you've you've the bargain is over kind of thing really but um, and I also think that you know the people that accompany you can affect your um, enjoyment of something Um yeah, you know, I know that I'm affected by whether my wife likes it or not. I mean, if I really, really, really like something, and I can almost feel in my bones that it's not her kind of film, that it doesn't affect anything. But um, sometimes, if she's really taken by something, it can really, it can really increase my enjoyment of it afterwards, kind of thing. For instance, she was she it was unexpectedly she doesn't like any superhero films at all, or really any fantasy mm-hmm. films. Like she always says, 
anything with pointed ears and beards don't take me so, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I we did go and see Joker and she would absolutely love Joker I think yeah. because it was a kind of anti superhero film in a way and I, I loved it as well but kind of I think we fed off each other in our enjoyment of it I think does that happen That's with you guys when you when you see a film, yeah. I, I, I'm a strong believer that that you kind of form your opinion within that kind of almost minute and a half when you come out of the cinema. Yeah, my my wife has no; she's very similar in that she has no interest in fantasy or definitely not science fiction. That that can do one as far as she's concerned. <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, and but, um, she watched The Magicians and she absolutely loved that. Just completely taken by that, and I think that the, part of it was kind of the meta storytelling which she liked. A part of it was, was she can just like the people in it if she you could if she can like a person, but she also can't watch anything where anyone's buried alive. She read a book when she oh. was born. yeah mm. she read a book called The Girl oh, in the Box. That's, that's, that's very and, and, uh, fundamentally po, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I tell you the one thing, the one thing I have trouble with, and I can watch. Everyone's different. This is the curious thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, I can, you know, I remember one of the most shocking things I saw in the cinema at the time. It's nothing now. 1971 or thereabouts when um, The Vampire Lovers, the first scene of The Vampire Lovers, was like the first time I'd seen anything like when Peter Cushing lifts up Ingrid Pitt's head, I think it's her, or maybe it's not her, and cuts her head off. Maybe it's not him in in the prologue, but whoever it was in the prologue cut someone's head off and it really looked like they cut the head off and i thought jesus christ um so i can watch decapitations and limbs coming off and blood spouting around that kind of thing but i tell you what really gets me and you're going to think i say injections which is partly true but i don't like seeing injections because that's all too kind of like every day in a way but Mm -hmm. what i can't what i can't stand is bullying can't stand uh, yeah. someone walking down the street and like five guys going up and picking on them. Somehow I, I find that almost unwatchable. It's absolutely yeah. ridiculous because I can watch all sorts of other mayhem and, and monstrous uh, gore and all the rest of it. Uh, probably because there's a, there's an element of reality about that that I find mm. really uncomfortable. It's really interesting. I have a friend who, for similar reasons literally is unable to watch, you know, that kind of cringe comedy that became very popularized with, with Ricky Gervais and the office of, you know, is that me? No, it's not. not, Okay. Well, you as well then, apparently, (laughs) but, but for similar reasons, because it, it, I mean, and that, that, you know, I I talked to him about that and he said, no, it's because it triggers his social anxiety, you know, watching it triggers his own feelings of, and he's like, he he just cannot engage with it. It's like for him, that's a horror movie. My my mum always used to say she couldn't, what is probably way out of your memory bank, but there's a comedian called Harry Worth, who used to be a little bit like Count Arthur Strong. He used to kind of like Mm. get in, get in a befuddled kind of state and, Mm. you know, things used to go wrong. And Basil Fawlty was another character. She couldn't stand that kind of chaos of a character huh. being in chaos, you know what I mean? Which is quite understandable I, uh, when you watched, think, when you analyse it. Yeah. I watched the first 10 minutes of The Office and thought, oh, my God, I worked for that prick and I don't want to watch him on TV. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that was it, well, that was it. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, I feel that about uh, Reginald, Reginald Perrin working at Sunshine Desserts. You know, I, I'd spent 10 years working in advertising and there were loads of kind of like, I didn't get where I am today by oh. not knowing the difference between the blancmange and the jelly, you know. And, and I literally <laughs> heard someone coming in, one of these young executives in the suit, came in one day and said in, in a great booming voice to me and my art director, <laughs> OK, guys, let's talk pickles. <laughs> what are you talking about? Let, let's talk pickles. Just hear yourself. <clears throat> there's, there's an inherent comedy and stuff that I remember working um, when I used to do electronics, and the box man came in, um, and they had a really long and intense conversation about boxes and cardboard ply. To the point of them nearly ending up fighting about what level of cardboard play they needed. And I was just sat at my desk crying with laughing. Oh, God, that's priceless. It's hard to beat real life for absurdity, isn't it? It just really is. I always think, like, I don't know how satirists work anymore. I really don't. It just feels like... No, it's beyond satire now. It's, yeah. In some ways, it's beyond horror as well, I think. I, was, <laughs> I think, you know... Um, 
kid, you know Adam Neville, don't you? I do, and, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think Ad, Adam um, is of the opinion that we're kind of living in, in a post-horror era, that everything is so much like horror, but um, we've got to keep ahead of the, <laughs> the kind of wave That's in a way. That's um, you know, and, and, of course, um, J.G. Ballard said that the only kind of rational way you can deal with modern life is to, is to deal with it as science fiction. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's uh, something to that uh, as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Have you ever written anything, Stephen, that is just sort of you thought, oh, I don't like that? that you mean abandoned something? No, not abandoned, yeah. gone with it anyway and just thought, oh. But something Maybe that's like... something that's unpleasant. Oh, to you personally, it's always... um, I'd, I'd I'd kind of put it further than that. I'm afraid I, I would say if I if I if I start to get a tingle that I dislike something, um, it makes me want to write it more mm. because it means that it means I've got to go there. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't. I'm cowardly in life, but I don't like to be cowardly in writing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think if something kind of gets my um, taste buds, whatever it is, morality buds in a way, <laughs> kind mm. of tingling, and I think there's something makes me uneasy here, or I don't know what I think about this. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is this character doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Are they? Do I like them? Do I not like them? All all those contradictions are actually um, catnip to me, really, to be honest. So I. Far from running away from it, I really, on the contrary, think I must be onto something here, um, mm. which which is probably just the nature of the kind of stories that I'd like to spend my time with, which are um, kind of raise moral questions or just get you to think about something. I mean, what, you know, so I heard another writer, was it Maggie O'Farrell on Desert Island Discs this morning? She said, you go on a journey with a book to find out what you think about something. Uh, and that is the mm. enjoyment of it. And mm. I think that is what, what it is to a certain extent. And I think if you know what you think about something, then it must be terribly boring to sit down and write about it. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> you can't imagine it's like walking, a, you know, uh, I, 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 can't, I, I was trying to think of a boring metaphor, but I can't even think of one sufficiently boring to that, that you kind of know what you think about the mm. characters, about right and wrong and that kind of thing. And you're never, you're never challenged by... Um, the subject matter that you're kind of dealing with, you know, I think it's um, would be a bit kind of like um, uh, moribund, really. It would be kind of arid mm. um, territory for me, anyway. Um, I love that you've been wouldn't. doing it. I love you've been doing it a tiny bit longer than us, but it's still clearly <laughs> a, sort of a, voyage, a voyage of discovery for you. When, when yeah, you're that's like, really exciting. Well, 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 like I say, yeah. I hasten to say, I mean, uh, you know, you've both. Been writing a hell of a lot. Don't put yourself down, but but you you wouldn't necessarily um, agree with what I just said. I'm, I'm not. Don't expect everyone to have. You know, I was just answering your question honestly, really. But I'm not saying that is the way for every writer to be. That would be ludicrous. Um, uh, other writers would be attracted to uh, different aspects of, of, of stories. You know, we're, we're, we're you know, we go down different paths. It's interesting what you said, though, because I think the way I've formulated it in the past when I've been thinking about this is that often, I mean, I I, I get a lot of my best ideas from nonfiction, from news stories, documentaries, things like that, or, or, and a lot of my best characters as well. And I think that one of my trigger points for something that I, I, I know I'm going to end up writing about is if I find myself thinking, I can't imagine why somebody would dot, dot, dot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mm. yeah. And the more I, the more my mind worries at something like that, the more it seems to become inevitable that at some point I'm going to end up writing about it because I'm going to want to try and find out why, what would, and, what and would I, make I think, I think it's a kind of what, what it's all what if, isn't it? Yeah. What, what I mean is what appeals to me is I think, Jesus Christ, that kind of person is so awful fundamentally. I can't even mm. get my head around why would someone do that? And then you think, yeah. well, what if I, what if, I could pull off a story where you actually have that kind of character, but you actually like them. That's the kind of thing. That <laughs> yeah. not, not, well, not kind of like, simply, you know, I'm not being crass about, you know, making a, making a serial killer comical. I, you know, I wouldn't, mm. I wouldn't say it in that way, but I, I'm saying that someone that you would naturally pull away from actually has a, 
as redeeming qualities, which gets then hopefully gets the reader or viewer to assess themselves a bit or assess their reaction to it, really. But um, and similarly, I think if uh, you know, I like to do it the other way around, which is a fundamentally good character or ordinary character has aspect then reveal aspects in them that is not so good, and then you say, "Oh, hang on." So it's it's those kind of oh hang on moments really. Mm. Maybe it's not a moment, but kind of like by the time you get to the story, you think, "Hang on, what 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 journey have I been on here? What do I think about that?" You know, and I like I'm not saying I always do that, but it's it's a nice feeling to achieve that if you can. You, you made me think about a story you wrote in a in in one of the crime wave anthologies. Forgive me, I can't remember the name of the story, but it was about a woman with a an adopted daughter, and gradually as the narrative developed you realized that the nature of their relationship was somewhat different to what you'd originally f- and it and it had an absolute it was an absolute fire axe through the door of an ending it was just surreal <laughs> I'm sure you don't know what i'm talking about um but it's exactly that i think whether it's it's because that's a good example of where you've i think anyway you've imagined someone because obviously that someone who's done something like incredibly irredeemably awful but then the whole yeah, narrative yeah. is told from their perspective and is very I can't, I, I can't help thinking of uh what if it's the other way around okay because mm. you get spoon-fed things on the news you know um uh, and I'll, I'll spin off in different directions and think well what does the other person think you know like mm. i'm not saying this as a for instance because i've never written this but there was a documentary the other night about the james bulger kidnapping um yeah mm-hmm. yeah and for instance if you know watching that thing and the footage that was involved i might think well who else was going to that shopping you know who, who else was shopping and what were they shopping for and did they see this kid did right. they interact with these other kids what did what did the two kids do before they saw the little boy what yeah. would that scene be? You know, and it's kind of perverse. I'm not saying it's not perverse. It is perverse, <laughs> but it's kind of it's kind of um, contrarian as well, you know. But but somehow that's the way I kind of think into stories. I'm, I'm thinking. Sorry, I should say I'm thinking really of kind of short stories and and um, uh, you know books and novellas here that mm. I've been writing more recently rather than TV work. I mean, TV TV work tends. Know, and film to some extent doesn't tend to kind of welcome that kind of contentiousness and and um, uh, questioning kind of quality <laughs> but that certainly by the time you've gone through the the system that asks all the questions you know irons all the questions out of it um, the kind of um, the kind of morality ends up being hmm. if you're not careful quite simplistic you know what I mean um, yeah so I, I kind of reserve the way I kind of keep my impulse to do those kind of edgy um, and uh, kind of disturbing little things kind of on the side in a way. Um, but, but you know, I've got no idea really what, um, you know, I could probably analyze it. I don't, I don't have time to sit down and analyze what are the common themes between my films, my TV work, <laughs> you know, the, the things I've written for the theatre and the and the stories, I, I just I just want to keep doing the stories. It's for someone mm-hmm. else to figure out what links them all together in a way. Because you, you've mentioned film, film and and novels. We had um, Matt Platley, who's, who's a, a, a film and TV writer on for our last thing, and, and we asked him about novels, and he was very much a no, thank you, Mrs. Um, <laughs> about it. Um, is there one of those, Stephen, that you feel is more you? Are you a film person or a novel person, or, or are they? Is it just all you, and you couldn't choose between? There isn't a fair. Um, um, it depends how it depends what I'm working on at any one time. <laughs> it's a bit like you know the beginning of Apocalypse Now when they say, um, "When I'm there, I want to be here. And when I'm here, I want to be there. And when I'm there, I want to be here." Uh, that's how I feel about the kind of difference between uh, you know film and I mean film can be very very uh, punishing in terms of I mean it's all wall to wall collaboration basically, and if you don't like that, you, you know out of dodge kind of thing um so there's that there's a lot of joy in that which is some fantastically clever people improve your work and contribute mm-hmm. to it and you know i can't pretend that seeing actors bring to life what you've put on a page isn't fantastically exhilarating and and you know almost the most exciting thing i can imagine doing as a writer so there's that 
but you do kind of pay for it in a way by the way you know the industry treats writers and the way things are taken uh, out of your hands and that kind of thing so it's a it's a it, there's a trade-off there's a trade-off in that whole industry that um wears down writers after a while i mean i've been doing it for decades mm. and it's funny that right back in um in time from uh, i i suppose to william goldman the famous uh, kind of guru of screenwriters and genius writer in you know um i think eventually became more or less a kind of script doctor on the one hand highly paid script doctor and on the other hand did his original work in books because he didn't want to he didn't want to he couldn't be asked to be screwed by the system anymore he'd done enough of that and he thought right i'll just be a highly paid guy that comes in and does it does a does a three week polish for a film that's going to be made take my check and then write my books um mm -hmm. and i can see where you i can see why you'd get to that point really at the moment i still absolutely love the just the idea that a tv show could happen or a mm -hmm. film could happen and uh you know every time it does for me i do really enjoy that moment you have on the set or hopefully more than a moment um sometimes you, you get involved more than others um that idea of kind of getting on the train and going to the set and seeing a hundred people all beavering away in different ways and seeing the actors in costume and the sets being built and it's all happening because you had this sometimes you can literally remember when you had the idea of the thing that they're doing that's a mm. weird feeling I actually think you know six weeks ago this was in my head um and that's a that's a almost mystical certainly magical experience you know so i suppose that's that's the nearest as a writer you can get because me, me and Kip have both been musicians and we've both lamented the fact that you, as a musician you get a moment of absolute magic with a band where it all clicks and you're like, I'm doing this thing and it's brilliant. Yeah. And you don't really get that, that as a writer. That's that's true. I don't, I, I don't think you feel it um, when you're writing um, um, short stories either, really. I mean, you can, have a, you can have a moment of clarity where you think something clicks. Um, it's funny. I'm very close to, you know, certain friends that are writers that it also knows. I won't mention them by name, but um, uh, when when I think that we have the same feeling when any of us finish a project, uh, we kind of always emo each other. We always say the same thing: is I'm really not sure this is any good. Yeah, it becomes, <laughs> becomes yeah. almost ludicrous because I know these writers that I'm talking to are bloody brilliant and. So I kind of just kind of laugh, and I'm sure they laugh back at me when I say it to them. Because <laughs> there's that strange thing that happens when you, you're you immersed in something and you pull it off and you think, well, maybe it's just the slight euphoria of just having finished the bloody thing yeah. is making me feel it's good. On, on the other hand, am I just eating myself up for no reason? Maybe it is actually good. And that's why um, I think beta readers, uh, you know, are very, very important. Not, not yeah. there's, a, there's a a world of difference, I think, from say script editors that you you um, you work with on in television and film, who are employed by the producer to kind of work on the production. Okay, they they kind of the way report to the to the producer. So the the production is their vested interest, not you as a writer. Mm -hmm your writing but if you if you have a um a short list of people that you can rely on that that want to read your latest story and offer to without without kind of taking the piss you say, you know always ask politely and that kind of thing but if they do want to read it uh and you trust their judgment you know you don't you don't really want to, them to say i like it i don't like it that's irrelevant just mm. just kind of what is wrong what doesn't quite work yeah. is it getting somewhere that kind of thing and i just find those absolute gold dust I, I don't understand people not we all know loads of people that are really really good writers and readers and uh, i really value them i think that's right and I, for me the question with beat readers is always tell me what doesn't work i mean it, obviously it's it's I'm never going to pretend it's not gratifying to hear when something does. Mm. Obviously, it is, but but really, what I want to hear is where doesn't it work? Where does it where does it fall down? I remember Neil Gaiman talking about this in a piece of writing advice, and he said that he always felt that 
feedback that was very, very specific and said you should do this was very, rarely helpful. But the feedback mm. that was gold was this doesn't quite work and I'm not sure why. That was actually the best feedback because that was an honest issue with resonance and that was therefore something that he really needed to fix. Whereas the other kind of advice was more like, it's almost like if I'd written this, this is what I'd do, which is, well, you didn't, mate. I did, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But sometimes I'm actually, um, I mean, sometimes it's just, it is good to have someone um, say, I think this, this, this works perfectly well, don't worry about it, and it works because... Mm this, that, and the other, this, you know, sure. I get, you get your subtext, that your subtext is this, it's completely clear, you've got no worries about X, Y, Z, which I'm sure you are worried about, you know, that kind of thing, people can be mm. really good. On the other hand, I can, I have got good feedback from someone that said, um, oh, I really didn't, you know, I really didn't take to this main character, you know, I think the third act doesn't quite work, or something like that, and I've, that was on a whole screenplay that I wrote, that I thought, you know, I, Truthful, I, I was I was going to say I thought it was getting somewhere. I didn't really think it was getting somewhere. I thought it wasn't working. But when I heard, when I had someone list the ways it wasn't working, I thought, oh bloody hell, I can't make this work. And so I stuck it back on the shelf where where it rests to this very day. Mm. Um, so it persuaded me that it wasn't ready to go out. I wasn't ready to fix it, you know. And and I kind of lost interest. So there is that danger. There is that danger that that someone can actually um, make you kind of um, unshy. Is that the word? You know, uh, yeah. lose yeah. lose confidence in something. But I'd rather, yeah. Often it's it, 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 it's it's a it's confirming either confirming that you're not really sure what you're doing or confirming that you got it right. So that's it's confirmation uh, that you that you someone need. Someone once someone was asked me if it's if I find it hard being edited and having somebody come back and give this sort of in-depth criticism. And then my first reply is, is always, no, I'm just happy people are paying attention. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. you spend so long with nobody paying attention. Um, and then, but, but actually that, that process is wonderful because it helps clarify what I'm thinking. But, that, but what I mean about the difference between a script editor and, and uh, if I'm asking someone to give me advice and I feel I feel if I'm asking someone to give me advice, then I'm still in control. I can ignore that mm. advice or take it completely on board, and I'm the boss. If I, if a script editor is giving me notes, then they're paying me, and they're telling me to do the changes. So it's it's kind of where where's the power <laughs> is the question. Um, mm. And ideal, ideally, um, everyone should be in it together, and you should feel that you're working towards the same goal. But I wish it was that case. It's not always that that case or it doesn't feel like it sometimes and that's where i think that i think certainly in in film and tv the development process never gets easier never gets mm. easier however however eloquent you get at expressing your thoughts and um however nimble you get at trying to problem solve and offer solutions to what they want uh someone coming in and and um uh potentially riding roughshod over what you've done so far and then being able to um, um, get out of the mud and figure it out is the toughest thing in writing. I mean, any any person in the street can come up with, if they sit, if you chain them to a desk, they can come up with a few thousand words. There's no problem sticking fucking words on paper, is there? <laughs> the question, first of all, is which ones do you cross out and do again? That's the big <laughs> question, and the second and the second question is, what do you do when someone tells you how to improve it? it it's the second and third things that are important. Mm -hmm. Sticking stuff down on paper. I mean, how often have you heard someone say, um, "Oh, I'm a writer. I wrote, uh, I wrote, you know, uh, I wrote a fifty-five page uh, company report the other day. I think I'm really good with that language." Yeah, but no one rewrote it for you. You didn't cross it out. How many drafts did you do? How many times yeah. did you think about what you were expressing? And I guarantee if I read it, I think it would probably be gobbledygook. You know, um, so people have this delusion about what makes a writer. You know, I do uh, think what makes a writer is not putting words on paper. It's crossing them out, definitely. Uh, anyone can write, but that's, make, that's making them good is... Is, is that Scott? Is it? Hello. Hi, Scott. Scott, uh, are, you in a 19, job, are you in a 1940s aircraft? Is that, is that what it sounds like? It is, yeah. 
I'm sorry, bad, bad system. <laughs> I, I will, I will just shut up. <laughs> no, no, it's no, no, no. It no, we can hear you better now. We can hear you better now. Okay, I was just saying <laughs> that's what I do for my my day job as a content editor. I take reams and reams of content written by civil servants, mostly who think they're really good at explaining things and haven't got a clue <laughs> what they're talking about. <laughs> really? And I, I just really? go through it all with my big red pen and I rewrite it and I send it back to them, and then they absolutely lose their shit. Like, how dare you cross out my my wonderful nuggets of of, of beautiful gobbledygook? Yet yeah, and and, and, and yet we're we're, we're we're supposed to be the sensitive ones, the over sensitive. <laughs> yeah. to, to the extent once that I actually, uh, by going through and rewriting their prose, I realised they understood it so badly they had not understood their own policy, and I had to sit them down and explain <laughs> that their own policy didn't work. <laughs> and that's that's in part why we never got a CO two charge in London. Fact, fact. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that was a scoop. <laughs> I, th- I think actually a really valuable thing I did when I was quite young was I worked for a big corporation and under the aforesaid Ricky Gervais. Um, no, it, yeah, uh, not the actual Ricky Gervais, but a man. Oh, I see. Right, him. got you. Yeah, yeah, um, and. I had to write letters to people who were very angry explaining what had happened to the public. What had happened was always very, very complicated, and I had to make that understandable. And I think that that was quite a valuable skill as a writer to say something as simply as possible in the least Uh, words. I, I um, as I said earlier on, I worked in advertising. Did I say earlier on I worked in advertising? Yeah, yeah. Did, yeah. Um, and it did. It did teach me um, loads of things that that uh, have have been valuable in my writing life. To be honest, um, because when I came straight from college, I'll be honest, I was incredibly shy. I mean. I would have a meeting and just not speak in the meeting. And I'm sure this is the experience of a lot of people, especially women out there, which is you come to the end of the meeting and you think you're going to say something and you think, no, I won't speak up. And then somebody else says what you were about to say and they get a round of applause and you think, hmm, I missed out there. But gradually, because I had, a, I was working with a, a um, quite a good person um, who was very flamboyant. My art director was very liked to do the presentations and did all the talking and that kind of thing. So I actually went into my shell very much more. But he would encourage me to sometimes present our creative work, um, and it actually broke new ground for me because it meant I could actually face a bunch of people around the table mm-hmm. and talk about why I decided things creatively. Okay, it might have mm-hmm. been for. Canada. It might have been for um, dog food uh, or the, the um, uh, um, you know, road safety campaign that I worked on. Um, or it might have been, you know, a, a kind of plug to put in the wall or something. But, you know, completely irrelevant things. But you still had to stand up and see and, and look at the chairman in the eye and talk about why he should do our campaign and not the other one. So, you know, cut to 10, 15 years later when I'm trying to pitch uh, script ideas to a big producer or a studio, then those kind of skills became really useful to be able to express your, your idea and not sit there like a dumb uh, dumbass, you know, with nothing to say, you know, because this, you know, I kept, I would, I would actually say to myself before I went into meetings, pretend you're someone else. That's what I would mm. always advise a writer going into mm. meetings. Because let's face it, most of us are incredible introverts. The reason we're writers is we don't really want to, most of the time, encounter the outside world if we can help it. So we certainly don't want to meet these powerful people. So you just take a deep breath before you go through the door and pretend to be someone else. They don't know who you are. You know, when I, I remember met, you, yeah. I go on. I was just going to say, I remember you talking about that in Coffee Makers Blues, which is your your nonfiction collection of of um, columns and essays, which is uh, just, I think, one of the great pieces of writing about writing that's out there. I put it up there with with Stephen King's on writing, and uh, you know, uh, well, that's the main one actually. <laughs> that's the main other one that I think <laughs> of. Um, but like, it, because it's full of these, it's full of really practical i mean just real life stories stories of you doing things and and yeah i remember vividly reading your the piece you talk about there where you talk about pitching and you describe what you've just said there about 
you know, effectively, I suppose, I suppose getting into character, right? That's what we're talking about. Mm. Yeah, it's just to fool myself into thinking I'm someone with much more confidence than I actually am, because I yeah. owe, basically because I owe it to my work. If I care about my work, um, I owe it to my work to be confident, or at least pretend to be confident. Yeah. I don't have a lot of time for people that say, oh, I could get on in this industry if only I was confident. I think bullshit. Just just fake it. Fake that you're yeah. confident. And yeah. you know what? Sooner or later you will be confident. That's that's the good that's the downside that's that's really good. Um if you're happy living not being confident, then you know, go away. Go away and don't bother, you know. It's kind of <laughs> like if you care it, it means you don't care enough about your work. But if you care about your work and especially if you want to be a professional writer um as a career then get over yourself, you know? Does that sound really of, harsh? But <laughs> I do think that. Only because I've been on that kind of journey, really. One of the great things for unlocking a sense of confidence is that moment when you suddenly realise nobody knows what they're doing either. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you're, still, you're, you're making it up as you go along as well. And, and that, kind of, that's that's, <laughs> absolutely, that's yeah. absolutely brilliant, yeah. There's quite an interesting thing going on in the chat. People are talking about being beta readers, and um, and it's just reminded me of something. When I very first started out seriously thinking about I'm going to write novels, I had a beta reader who just cheerleaded what I was doing, totally uncritical, and it was one of the most valuable things I ever had. I'm not sure I would have finished my first novel without that. Mm. And and we we always talk about criticism and. Uh, but I think sometimes you just have somebody going, yeah, yeah, as long as you, you don't believe it and you know that <laughs> <laughs> you are going to have okay, to have I absolutely agree. You've got yeah. to have, I mean, the, the, the world well, the world is cruel, as we know, but also the industry is mm. quite harsh. Mm. Um, so yeah. we get enough rejection and enough subtle cruelties along the way that it does no harm to... Um, uh, I praise people and encourage people. I don't understand. I mean, it, I don't see it really in the world of writers, to be honest. I see it in other avenues, but I don't honestly see many people kind of not being supportive of, of other writers. At least the ones I gravitate to seem to be supportive of mm. others. And I don't see a lot of, what do they call it, pulling up the ladder after them, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, uh, no, I think, I think by... By far, the majority of, of people, you know, that I know are people that extend the ladder down, if you like, or at least leave it there. Um, mm. um, but uh, yeah, everyone negotiates their way of of, um, kind of dealing with the kind of pact with the devil, i.e., getting the job, and then and mm. then you know, going back home, and then it's the same old job when you shut the door and and got the keyboard in front of you. That that doesn't get any different, you know. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I I have heard uh, I've heard stories about certain genres being a bit more cutthroat than others, perhaps. And I, but I don't know how true it is because I, the, it's always suspiciously, it's always genre circles I don't move in that I hear in the more oh, dodgy ones. Yeah, yeah. But horror, for sure. I I I've never. It's it's one of the things that's always kind of continually. I mean, it should not be surprising by this point in my life because I've met you know I've been blessed to meet a lot of horror writers actually, but like. I genuinely can't think of a single one. I'm sure there must be some out there, but they've all been unfailingly generous, polite, pleasant to be with, you know, generous of their giving of their time uh, and interested in what other people are doing. It's, it just seems to be. um, Yeah. It's the, it's the comedy writers that are bitter, twisted. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Resentful. Yeah. (laughs) Scheming. (laughs) <laughs> On their fourth, fourth divorce and second liver, yeah, sure, sure. I think the other, I think the other lot is that supposedly, which is quite comical when you think about it, romantic novelists are quite competitive, aren't they? I've heard the romance scenes a bit cutthroat. Yeah, that's what I've heard. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know. I have no idea. I have no idea. But they probably say the same thing about us, right? They're probably at the romance mm. conventions. They all sit around going, "Oh, horror writers, they're a nightmare," you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I worked with a, a comedy writer for a bit, uh, and he was a lovely book, but he just could not handle the way that I work. I work by just writing what I want to write, and he works by following a very strict set of rules. and And he would send me his rules before we met and want me to read oh. them, which 
And I would just tell him, and he go, you've not read the rules? I'd go, no, you have. So I don't need to. You, you know all that. And he, he couldn't, just couldn't cope. It was really weird just to to run into something completely different from what, what you do. So yeah, comedy writers are a weird lot. <laughs> <laughs> if I go back to TV for a second, because um, we, when I mentioned that you were the person who wrote uh, yeah. the the TV adaptation of Midwinter of the Spirit, uh, Scott immediately kind of jumped into me and said, "Oh, I really want to talk to him about that." And I'm conscious that we are sort of 50 minutes in. So, Scott, can I bring you in at this point? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, uh, sort of more generally, really, I suppose I'm interested in in what the difference is in the writing experience between writing something of your own, self-generated, uh, like Afterlife, and then comparing that to the job of adaptation, as you did on the the, the the Merrily Watkins adaptation. I was also wondering if it was if it was intended to be uh, an ongoing series, and and if if so, why it didn't happen. Um, um, well, can I, I I I'll answer the second part first. Um, because I thought it was. I was, I was amused at the Prime Minister's question time when they asked like. Five questions, and I think I've forgotten the first one now. Um, <laughs> I, I remember, I'll answer the the um, uh, the second one because it's more specific, and then the more general one about adaptation. Um, and what happened really was the intention was uh, that we do more than one of the Merrily um, novels. I think there's fourteen. There's probably more now. There were fourteen at the uh-huh. time. Um, <clears throat> actually started by adapting the 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 first one uh was the first one wine of angels was that the title um it was about cider making and um it was more uh, um no i can't remember much about it now but it was perfectly good uh and, and because it was the first book that introduced her um i thought we'd do the first one first but itv having allowed us to do a bit of work on it, um, decided the second book would be preferable. So we did Midwinter of the Spirit, which is the second book, um, and uh, as a three-parter. Um, and, um, uh, yes, the intention was that we would do the other books. But when it was uh, – it was originally it was originally commissioned for ITV Encore, you know, one of the kind of spin-off um, uh, channels of ITV. Um, uh and actually what happened truthfully was that they they liked it sufficiently that they wanted to put on the main channel, ITV1. Um, and also, whereas logic would have dictated that you'd put it on around the time, since it's called Midwinter and Spirit, it should be kind of mid-December um, or, say, November or around Halloween at the earliest, really. Um, and they decided, to, again, I think with the best will in the world because they liked it, um, to put it on much earlier, I think September. Uh, and guess what? They put it out to, uh, and it clashed with Dr. Foster, which is a, already mm. oh. in, its, in its third week, and it was a massive hit on BBC One. So we simply didn't get the viewing figures to justify them doing any more. Um, and, and the viewing figures actually decreased as the series went on, so we just didn't get that boost at the beginning they gave us plenty of on-screen advertising and that kind of thing but it was up against a kind of real blockbuster you know that people people were watching on bbc one even even i know there's catch-up and all that kind of thing but we were still we were still kind of hit by that unfortunately um but more generally about um <clears throat> yeah um i've done i've done kind of a lot of adaptations um that haven't hit the screen um, and it is a little bit different. I mean, I did, for instance, a movie version of John Wyndham's The Chrysalids. Um, I don't know if oh, any wow. of you know that book, but um, it was... Oh, uh, my word. I, would I also that. worked on, briefly on um, uh, The Glamour, um, uh, which is a book that I really loved. Um, uh, Christopher Priest um, was the author of that. And in each case, uh, apart from the glamour, glamour I knew and absolutely loved, uh, but the chrysalids I'd never read, weirdly. So the producer sent it to me, and I read it, and I thought, my God, this is a film. Why has this not been a film? Uh, and it basically hadn't been a film because the rights were tied up, and now they were free. So anyway, I worked on that, and Stephen Hopkins was going to direct it, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it never happened. So I have worked on several things over the over the years. Um it is different. Um, in a way, when you go into it, you think, you know what? I 
I'm going to do the best job I can, but I'm not going to put my heart and soul into this the way I do with characters I've invented myself. It wouldn't be quite as intimate a process as as it is with my own uh, stories. But you know what? By the time you get halfway through the process, you kind of feel they are your own. Um, <laughs> you become very protective of the project, more or less like you are with something that you have come up with. Even though I constantly remind myself that, you know, Phil, Phil Rickman is the genius behind the books. And, you know, I certainly couldn't have done anything at all without, you know him having done that um but um you kind of enter into it as a little more of a kind of little more of a kind of academic exercise because you know you're playing with uh the parameters that someone else has uh, has already set down so it's a kind of a it's a craft based project in a mm. way how do i turn this into that um and that in itself is quite interesting um but it's very different from just having a blank sheet of paper. Um, I don't know whether I've actually answered that other than just say the blindingly obvious. Um, uh, <laughs> no, no, fascinating. <laughs> but I'd, love, I'd love to read the screenplay of The Crystalids. It's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing <laughs> book. I mean, the thing about, when they sent me Midwinter of the Spirit, I thought, you know, I've seen those books around in bookshops for like, what, 15 years? And I thought, you know, I've always thought, and I told them this, I'm not going to read them. Because if I read them and like them, I'm sure as eggs, someone else is adapting them. So <laughs> I've kind of avoided them because I knew they were my territory. So when, the fact that I was thought of when they did want to adapt them was quite good. And then I thought when I started to read it, I thought, you know what? I don't really like the idea of a preachy, preachy kind of Christian hero. I mean, I don't happen to be have religious faith myself. Uh, and I would find it hard to have a religious character as the um you know main character it's just not the way i i would think i would do justice to it i mean luckily when i read it i thought this is exactly the kind of character i can write because almost even though she's a, a vicar she's kind of skeptical about what's going on around us so she's kind of she does have faith but it's kind of threatened the whole time and she she She's, um, you know, wrestling with her faith, and I thought, oh, I can, I can see this. You know, so mm. that was the, that was the big turning point for me in terms of whether I kind of do it or not. And I remember when I pitched it, uh, the the producer said, "So the supernatural bits, how how are you going to do the supernatural bits?" And I thought, excuse me, um, no, how are you going to do the supernatural bits? And I said, well, you've seen Afterlife, yeah? And he said, yeah. Well, I said. I, like that, all supernatural should come from the psychology of the character. It's the psychology of the person seeing the ghosts and having the experience that matters, not, you know, I just, you know, described it in the same way I'd written that. So that mm. seemed to do the trick. It seemed like kind of strange question. Maybe it wasn't to them, but it was strange to me because I write supernatural scenes the whole time. It, it doesn't seem like to graft those scenes onto an otherwise rational drama. It's part of the weft and weave of the story you're telling, you know? Anyway, that's it needed a bit of explaining, but apart from that, it was a great experience. It was a brilliant series, because we, we did not watch Dr. Foster. We watched... Um, it oh, good for, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 for you. Yeah. It, weirdly, my, my head doesn't work properly. The, the title hadn't stuck in my head, but Mary Lee's had stuck in my head, and as soon as it was, oh, God, we loved that. I'm a bit guided now. Yeah. There's not going to be more of it. Um, we usually have a bit where we talk about what we're working on, but I wanted to just change that slightly and ask Stephen if he has a dream project he would like to work on. Oh, that's a good question. Dream project. Um, that sounds like a, uh, sounds like. I mean, just because we were talking about adaptation, it sounds like have I got something that you know, if they were to. Um, Offer it to me, and then I would bite their hand off, kind of thing. Um, I don't know. Um, there's some things I can think of, but because kind of in the periphery of my vision at the moment, I don't want to jinx them. So, <laughs> I really want to happen. And of course, I've got I've got kind of four or five irons in the fire at the moment. Any one of which I would be really excited for them happening. I mean, one uh, there's a very, pretty low budget kind of film that. You know, we could easily, well, I'm hoping the producer can easily get off the ground because it's only a few people in the cast. Um, I'm working on a four-parter 
television, which hasn't got to the script stage. So if I got the go ahead to script, I'll be really excited about that. Um, but you were asking dream project, dream project. I think dream project would be more along the lines, if this is an acceptable answer, of uh, really having dream collaborators. Um, oh, okay. Be it, um, you know, kind of in terms of TV and film, you know, that that director that really makes something sing. And I don't necessarily mean a name director, although, you know, you can't avoid, the, you know, maybe Guillermo del Toro or someone like that would, would be mm-hmm. a dream to work with. Um, I'm also talking about someone, I mean, I talked to a director, for instance, um, a few weeks ago about a project of mine. Um, and he was so not effusive because, you know, kind of nine out of 10 directors and producers are effusive. That can, mm-hmm. that, you know, that butters no parsnips, as Tommy mm-hmm. Cooper used to say. Um, but, but they talk about the project in such a clear minded way that makes you just get a buzz from the fact that they understand it. They, they just hit the right marks in talking about your project. And even though that director is not well known, and you you wouldn't know the name if I say it to you, that would be my dream. Would be actually just to work with someone that is so simpatico that the the picture you have of the story, the way the story turns out, uh, can be realised. Of course, of course, the whole bargain is that it never can really. And this is the whole <laughs> thing that screenwriters have to get used to that took me a long time to realize is that however hard I try and put what's in my head on the paper, it will never be like that. This, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a delusion to think it's going to be anything really like that. It can come close to it, and in some ways it can even surpass it, but it's not going to be like it because the whole thing about, about working on paper is that, is that you're in control of that world. You know, you're in control of that world word by word letter by letter and it's mm. kind of perfect and the lighting is always perfect and that kind of thing <laughs> but um <clears throat> once you get into the practicality of realizing that in the actual outside world all sorts of things come to bear that make that impossible you know whether it be mm. you know as, as i've had in one thing an actor breaks their leg the night before so that actor can't do that scene so another mm. actor comes in that was also in the previous scene and does those lines and it worked out perfectly well you know but and i think that is the difference between a writer and a and a director is that a director is kind of like god they know how to manipulate the outside world and a writer <laughs> faced with those kind of oh my god it's all going wrong will just you know zip up a sleeping bag and crawl into the corner you know that's what i would do whereas the director kind of most directors kind of relish that kind of challenge to just pull something off, you know, and pull something out of the hat. Um, anyway, I'm rambling, but um, <laughs> your question was about dream. I think a dream, my dream would be more about a collaboration that is really exciting. It's, I'm starting to think now you've said that, that, oh, have we gone off? No, no, you're still there. Uh, that I should have been a director because, oh my God, it's all going wrong is basically my writing process. <laughs> <laughs> you're only a director if you say oh my god it's all going wrong and it's the writer's fault <laughs> <laughs> we, we've run out our official hour we so have. i'm very quickly gonna surprise kit with the um regular slot of the rightopolis playlist which is oh no i'm not thinking, prepared <laughs> um, one one song, anything you want, Stephen, that we will add on to the right off the list playlist, and um, I'm sure Scott has got one as well. Are, are you and Skit is Skit? Skit, skit. my friend. Skit, skit yeah. Skit. <laughs> skit. <laughs> yeah. Kit, okay. Kit uh, uh, my 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 song is um. Well, it's not really a song. It's a 25 minute piece of music, um, <laughs> and it's uh, by it's composed by Gavin Bryars, and it's called uh, Jesus Blood Never Failed Me Yet. And it's a sampling of Tramp singing the song, Jesus' Blood Never Failed Me Yet. Uh, and uh, it's played on a loop for the accompaniment yeah. of an orchestra that, that uh, plays with it. And it's quite mesmerizing and, um, and uh, extraordinary. 
And I don't know why when Kit mentioned this kind of desert island song kind of idea, <laughs> that was the one that sprung to mind. So that's the one I would offer to your uh, Museum of Curiosities. I, I love love the sound of that. I, I'm going to mm. listen to that. Um, Kate, you're banned from Bruce Springsteen and the Black Crows. <laughs> and well, Robert actually, Johnson. I checked back through the, the playlist. Robert Johnson as well, you're banned from too. Okay, fine. Well, that's all right, because I, the one I've, I, I, I was bluffing. I had one the whole time. Um, <laughs> so I'm going with Johnny Cash this time out. So oh, that's um, good call. One of the things that, that, that we didn't get to talk about with Stephen, unfortunately, because we ran out of time, is his, his new book, Under a Raven's Wing, which I'm reading right now and is phenomenal. Uh, it's, a, it's, about, it's, a, it's a series of um, long, short stories, and it's Sherlock Holmes as a young man in Paris, and mm-hmm. he is being tutored by the detective from Poe's story, Dupin. The, the the detective from Murders in the Room is actually oh, yeah genius. is is Sherlock's mentor and and it's and it's written by Holmes so it's from Holmes's mm. perspective um, and their their stories written at the end of his life and they're all like these could not be made public until now which I love I always love that kind of a framing yeah. anyway and that's the framing for it and then you're in and because it's Dupin the stories are also very Poe influenced so they're very grotesque and dark and scary. And it's it, and it's just a phenomenal book. It's this the, the evocation of of this period of Paris is just because it's not very you know the the revolution still kind of looms large in the public imagination and in the the street culture and it's just oh man I'm just having an absolute blast with it. It's you know because I know I know the next book I'm buying. <laughs> it's just, it's so you. great. You. It's you know because it is it's it's Holmes. I mean it's it's basically uh, you know early 20s Sherlock Holmes colliding with 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 Edgar Allan Poe stories in Paris and it's just and Dupin's a great character as well I mean Stephen's done some great work with that so anyway the reason I bring all that up is because I do a podcast on my own Patreon which is for Patreon backers only where I I read the Sherlock Holmes canon I'm actually doing that at the moment with a friend of mine Jack Graham and the theme tune we use for that podcast is a Johnny Cash tune and it's called God's Gonna Cut You Down so that's my choice yeah so that's my choice for the right up list playlist. That's oh, relevant that's to brilliant. me as well, because this week my uh, obsessive collection of all Holmes adaptations has reached the buying dodgy bootleg Blu-rays from Russia phase. Wow. <laughs> you got it bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've tracked down the 2013 Sherlock Holmes series they did, and I've just managed to get a German DVD of the uh, series that was filmed in Poland in 1980. Wow! I I just admire the the that's when you dive deep, you dive deep, my friend. I oh like yeah, it. oh yeah. <laughs> so so, what is your track, Scott? Um, the track. Okay, this week I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the depths of my origin story. Uh, my father's a, a folk singer. And mm-hmm. I grew up in the, the folk clubs of oldie England. So mm-hmm. I'm probably going to pick something by Jake Thackeray, who who I knew when I was growing up. Um, Are you going to go for La Di Da? No, I thought I might go for uh, The Bull. The Bull? The Bull. Okay. That's, I'm writing them down so I remember to put them on. Um, I'm going to, this week, uh, my wife Lindy found some pictures of her when she was 19, 20, and very goth, although she's still actually, as, as Kit and Scott will attend, she still she's is very goth. Still yeah. quite goth, RJ, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a tiny bit. But, um, quite goth. We, we, we set up a playlist of sort of a lot of songs from that time, and the song Celebrate by Fields of the Nephilim came up. Nice. Forgotten how much I absolutely love, and it's really mellow. So I'm I'm going to go for that. Um, do you think is Stephen prepared to hang around and do air t- uh, texts? I don't know, Stephen. I I, I did. I so, did. Oh, you mean book and books and books and TV apps? Yeah, read, that kind of thing. Yeah, I could quickly run through the kind of things I've been enjoying lately. If you fancy that, um, I mean, I have. Uh, I I did recently enjoy people listening to this who are interested in screenwriting. Screenwriting. <clears throat> There's a book called The Art of Screenwriting by Alistair Owen that I'd really recommend. It's interviews with screenwriters, 
Um, I mean, I'm a sucker for interviews with writers of all kinds. I think they're always in the gold dust. I mean, if you, mm. uh, I don't know if you agree with me, guys. Um, at the moment, mm. I'm reading The Hunger by Alma Katsu, um, which is a um, set during the Donner Party um, wagon train, the infamous uh, wagon train where everyone almost died. I don't actually know how many die because I haven't got the end of the book yet. But <laughs> it's um, rather like The Terror, which I don't know if you're enjoying on TV or the, yes. even with the Dan Simmons book. It's a historical horror. And um, as Kit has just explained, I'm kind of on a bit of a jag of historical horror um, you know, mixing real with unreal at the moment. So that's really in my groove. And um, and I guess that extends into one of the things I've enjoyed recently on TV as well, which is um, The Alienist, um, which I've catch, mm-hmm. caught up on quite recently, which is about a kind of Freudian analyst in turn of the century New York. And it's very kind of Sherlock holmes I don't know if any of you guys have enjoyed it. Yeah, I've watched it. I think it's a fantastic-looking series, apart from anything. Mm-hmm. How they recreated New York in, I think, Belgrade was where they shot it, is quite mm-hmm. extraordinary. And I, I, and it just got such a lot of panache to it. Uh, it's it's For me, it doesn't center enough on the main character. It kind of spreads out a little to subsidiary characters, but I just love the atmosphere of it, really. It's... Um, it's kind of a bit of, um, <clears throat> it's a bit of, um, uh, it kind of hits that nerve that Sherlock Holmes need mm. in me, really. Nice. But then again, then again, I've really enjoyed. I'm really enjoying at the moment two series, um, Your Honor with Brian Cranston, okay. um, which is about a, uh, a an American judge whose son kills someone in a hit and run accident, and it turns out the boy that's been killed. Is the son of a mob boss, um, so that's a hell of a good setup. Uh, nice. And the other one, the, the other one I'm really enjoying at the moment, so I'm flipping between the two, is uh, the boys um, about the, right. kind of the kind of subversive superhero um, yeah. series, which I'm absolutely loving because I think it's so kind of anarchic the way it it mm. really almost politically has a go at you know you know the feet of clay that our heroes have really and i'm really enjoying that um and, that's and interesting an incredible lot of panache in that as well in terms of the storytelling and the the wit uh i'm really enjoying because i've read the source comic book and i was i i'm kind of flabbergasted that anyone even attempted to adapt it because I, I, I remember that vividly so yeah I'll, I'll, I'll put that on my list i think that sounds good I don't know i don't i don't know the comic book so i can't say how sure. accurate it is or anything but the show is fantastic cool i've been watching the terror because um anything to do with big sailing ships uh is is absolutely my bag um, <laughs> i've had to know out of it because there's the scene that i know is coming because it's in every single thing about big sailing ships where somebody gets the leg cut off and i'm just oh. <laughs> no yes. no i'm gone i'm out of that i'm not watching this bit That's i it. can't <laughs> confirm that does indeed happen <laughs> It's like episode four or five, I can't remember, but it does the spoilers, I guess. For, yeah, it's it's yeah. the one I've stopped at. The right, there you go. Oh, superb. Great book as well, as is The Alienist. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, I, TV, I finished The Great, which uh, I really, 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 really enjoyed. I thought that was a superb show, and I'm really, oh, I'm really hope, hope there's a season two, because that was mm. really exciting stuff. Um, other than that, I've mainly been doing the, the the Marvel Cinematic Universe rewatches with the kid, which has been a delight because watching those movies with an 11 year old, whatever you think of them in terms of as an adult, watching them with an 11 year old is watching them as they should be watched. And uh, it's just a joy because it's, you know, it's, it is well made popcorn cinema and she's having a blast with it. So, so am I. Um, so that's really nice. And I think, and I, and again, I'm just, I'm reading Stephen's book at the moment and it's, uh, I'm racing through it because it's just fantastic. So. Uh, by the way, uh, RJ, if you're looking for a, um, uh, an arm severing scene, there's an excellent one in um, a film called The Sisters Brothers. Um, and that I'm is really not. No, I know you're not, but it just brought it brought to mind how, how absolutely testicle um, shrinking that scene was when I saw it last week. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to add it to my list of things I must never watch. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it, it is a weird thing how because I've spent a lot of time in and out of hospital. How, how after that, my appetite for watching actual real medical things is just gone. I'm like, no. <laughs> Just, uh, I'm sure it would. <laughs> <sighs> okay. I, I think we've done. I lost the ability to speak then for, for a second. <laughs> you were thinking of severed limbs and it completely threw you. I was it? <laughs> just like. Oh. I lost the powers uh, of speech. We, um, can, um, sever the, we, can, we can sever the conversation. How's that for a There we go. Uh, that requires a, a lot less rum and big blades and subtles. <laughs> Stephen, it's been an absolute honour. Thank you so much for agreeing to spend the evening with us. It was an uh, absolute it was delight. It seemed, to, it seemed to really fly by. I must have done a not, lot of nattering because it seemed uh, it seemed very quick. <laughs> it's, it's been re- it's been really good. Uh, and you're Super. welcome to come back again. We, we're going to try and do repeat guests. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll be on for that. Definitely, it's been good fun. Yeah. Fantastic, been talking to you. Yeah, all right then. All right. Bye then. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And thank you, citizens of Rightopolis. It's been uh, yeah. as never. It's been a pleasure to spend an evening with you. We we should just do some quick um, updates on the world of Rightopolis as oh, it Lord. stands. Yeah, we should, shouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We should. It's it's okay. it's it's. Business. Go to the go to the announcements channel. It's all there. Is it? Mm-hmm. Oh, I've got an announcements channel, but I think we should talk to them about it as well. Really? Okay. We can't. We can't just sort of put these things from on high. I mean, if they can't read, what's the point? I mean, <laughs> you've come <laughs> this far, folks. Come on. <laughs> what I'm about assuming the ones... you don't need me to talk to you at this. Point. Why do you you're here talking? The ones who yeah. All right. No. I'll just... say. All right. You persuaded me. Let's talk about it. Fine. What do you want yeah, to about... talk about? Um... <laughs> I want to talk about my evil twin, RJ Dapp. No. <laughs> <I want> <laughs> Preemptively <laughs> barred from Ryotopolis, you do realise that. Yeah, yes, he is completely never going to appear. Um, we, we have a Patreon. We do. And we, we should explain that it's not relentless money grubbing, although there is an element of that, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, only, it's occasional. It's not relentless. Yeah. It's a light, yeah, it's a... a light smattering of money grubbing, yeah, light in, in, in with some delightful content, as I believe the kids yes. are calling it these days. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the, the the hope is that if if the Patreon makes enough money, we will put the podcast onto podcast. I don't know what they're called. Kit does podcast catchers. Yeah, that's right. I mean, basically, it's a monthly subscription mm-hmm. to get it attached to them, and uh, you know. So yeah, as soon as we got to the point where we're making enough money through the Patreon to afford that, we'll do that. But mm. the way the Patreon works, and I'll just lay it out for you now, and you should all go there, even if you have absolutely no intention of parting with your money, which, to be fair, that's absolutely fine. But the yeah, reason we're not should... about your money. No, no, no. But the reason you should go there is because it is where we're going to release the podcast for the moment. The pilot's already up there, and the way I'm doing it is for the next four episodes that we've got in the can, I'll be releasing one a week. Now, the way it works is if you back it on the Patreon, you will get it seven days ahead of everybody else. So really all you're getting for your money is a little bit of exclusive access. But what it does mean is the so I'm doing it on Friday. So the Friday after a Rightopolis, it will go up for backers. The Friday after that will go up for everybody. So if you go in now to Patreon and subscribe to the site or just follow our feed, what that means is as the episodes become available to the public, you can get them there. Now, again, in the long term, if we've got enough money coming in, we'll do this through a podcast catcher, and then you'll be able to get them wherever you normally get them. But for now, for those of you who do want to listen back, that's that's your route through. And as I say, so what's happened at the moment is uh, the pilot's already up. Uh, the Cat Wards episode has dropped for backers, and we'll be going live to the mm-hmm. public next Friday. And we'll do it on a weekly schedule until we've cleared the backlog, and it will be, as with the show, fortnightly thereafter. And um, the the five... Dollar tier, it's tiers, tiers. Yeah, probably like five dollars. There's a limited amount of them because it's um, it's a you definitely get to have your question asked rather than us just missing it because we're listening to the guest talking. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> we we do tend to do that. Um, so we will definitely ask questions from the five dollar backers, and then the what what about people that have dollars? Kit? 
Actually, I think it's being. I think it's in pounds. So I think the question should be people who don't have pounds. I think it's five pounds. But yeah. So oh. just to be clear about that, I mean, as as of now, ask questions in the chat. If we grab them in the chat, we'll, we'll, we're not. Mm-hmm. Again, we're never we're never charging for access to any of the stuff we do, and that's really important yeah. that you understand that. Our whole point of doing this is that it should be, you know, always free yeah. forever, and it will be. This is about if you if you have the money spare and you want to contribute to to help and get the show on podcast catchers, then lovely. Thank you. That's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. Um, um, the, the, uh, I've lost my thread. What was I talking about? Um, uh, and you get a fancy title. You get a fancy title. That's really the most important part. Yeah, you get yeah. a fancy title on Discord. Sorry, questions. Yeah, ask questions in the chat, save us all. But what I will do going forward is when we know the guest is going to be, I'll actually put up a post in the Patreon for people who are backing at that level. And then you can ask your questions there ahead of time if you want. Just put them there in writing and we'll, uh, we'll make sure they get asked of, of whoever the guest is. I'm not sure if Kit and Scott have noticed their fancy titles yet. But... I've noticed mine. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I am a that. mysterious interloper. Yeah, yeah you are a mysterious interloper. Yeah, I, thought, I thought they were. I, thought I, suited quite, you as I well. quite like that air of, air of mystery that attaches to me. I imagine you wearing a tricon hat and a little mask. Do you know, there's actually a guy here in Tunbridge and he always <laughs> wears a tricon hat. I, I can't fault him. I've got one next Genuine. to me at the moment. Full length uh, leather coat, ponytail, hmm. tricorn hat, all the time. Nice. And so I am good. definitely heroic proletariat, so I'm down with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the next Rightopolis, we're doing a kind of relaxed, and it's just going to be me, Kit, and Scott talking. You rubbish. know what? It's kind of going to be. It's going to be our formal meet Scott K. Andrews because he's been our yeah. guest host for a couple of episodes now, but we decided it was past time that we, we gave an episode all to himself, turned the spotlight on him, and really you know, welcomed him formally aboard the team. So, and yeah. and I think we'll probably, it'll probably for that reason as well, be a bit of a listener's mailbag as well. So if there are questions mm-hmm. you have for any of us, um, start thinking on that now, because it'll probably be a bit more free flowing. Uh, yeah, that'd perhaps. be quite nice actually. Yeah, it'll be, be really good. It'll be really, I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. People are wanting to ask about my new best friend, Bill Bailey. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. I, 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 I met Bill, we watched um, Limbo Land, Bill Bailey's new thing that's on the iPlayer. It's not mm-hmm. that new because it was done before, I think. And I mentioned it on Twitter that we watched it. And then I mentioned how I met my wife because I was in the stalls of Bill Bailey's Bewilderland, I think. And I saw this girl. No, I was in the circle and I saw this girl in the stalls and thought, that is the girl I want to be with for the rest of my life. Um, and then through a series of bizarre coincidences i am married to her now <laughs> and and um if it hadn't worked out it would have been stalking but it did so it wasn't <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but bill Bailey said that's a lovely story and thank you so he we had a little bit of a chat and now i'm going to turn up outside his house at some point with my family <laughs> which will also be stalking and may not have quite as happy an ending although if uh, in a fortnight's time, it turns out that RJ is now married to Bill Bailey. We'll know it all worked out. <laughs> so we, we await further developments with interest. Oh, oh, oh dear. Um, I'm going to... <laughs> I can see me and Bill together. He'd have to wear the dress because he's smaller than I am. I just, it's just, I'm not against wearing dresses. I, would quite, I could pull it off. I've got the legs for it, but I think it looks weird. Quite traditional like that. I think the bride should be slightly smaller than the groom. I think I broke myself for that one. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. Well, on that bombshell. I was going to ask you what you've been working on this week, Kit. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, Actually, quite, quite a lot of things. I'm quite fired up at the minute. So back to the novel, uh, I'm rewrite. I've got basically one section where i'm entirely rewriting so um that's the last big bit of effectively original work that needs doing on the novel as opposed to tinkering and i've gotten about four or five thousand words on that over the last week i'm getting to it not every day but most days and and getting at least some time on it and i'm really thrilled about that i'm actually right it's turned into Send it to a love story, which is not something I'm used to writing. And I'm actually really, I've, I've found, I think actually a previous guest really infected my thinking because what I've done is created a situation where what the main character wants and what they need are poles apart. 
and it's actually wow. it's it's a really on the surface of it it's a love story but actually it's very tangled because the person she's falling in love with is someone she needs for a very utilitarian reason indeed and, oh, and mr patley by any chance so no but she she was yeah yeah it was yeah yeah that's right yeah, yeah. she was yeah sorry uh, but the point is that she's planning to she she was originally planning just basically to manipulate this guy to get what she wanted for various reasons it would be consequence free only now she's falling for him and it's made it horrible because she still needs to do what she needs to do, but it's going to involve manipulating someone she's actually now starting to care for. So it's really, really, it's created this whole other thing I wasn't expecting. Um, you feel the tension ratcheting up as you're oh, saying that. It's, it's yeah. so, and, and it, the thing is what that means is it's really like, I can't wait to get back to it. It's really exciting to write. But the other thing I have done is, um, well, I did the podcast edits as well, which I've been working on. But the other thing that I did was a nonfiction. Well, I say a nonfiction essay. It was. I, I got a piece of commission work to do. Uh, I don't know how much I want to say about it because it, I'm still not 100. percent It's going to happen, but I've written it. But the idea is basically it's a it's a it's a an essay written as a review of a piece of work that doesn't actually exist because it's an April the first thing. So the idea is that it's. I mean, the original brief was write about a sequel that doesn't exist, but you wish did, as though it were real, which is already a great brief. But I've I've taken it as you might expect given that it's me a few steps further and i've written something completely bonkers um (laughs) which is fine but also far longer than the brief which is not fine so i'm going to spend some time tonight editing it down so that it's only a thousand words more than it should be instead of two thousand and then and then i'm going to send it in and just say because i'm still i'm still comfortably ahead of deadline that's the good news so i'm going to send it and say look this is still too long. I'm really yeah. sorry. Read it. If you like it, you can use it. If you want to cut it down, let's talk about how we cut it down because I can't cut it anymore. Or if you want me to write one of the other things I pitched you, I'll do that instead. Because <laughs> like, so I think that's the way I'm going to play it because it's I have kind of it's really distressing. Like I thought I could write two thousand words. I could write two or two thousand words, you know, brief in my sleep at this point, and I've completely blown this one. Completely yeah, but they should be thankful. Blown. <laughs> you're giving them four thousand words because that's like ordering your dinner in a restaurant and getting two dinners. Yeah, but you see, some people yeah. don't want two dinners. Okay, <laughs> what's, what's wrong with right? them? <laughs> it's like we ordered five guys tonight, and I ordered like a portion of chips each, and I looked at it, I was like, "That's enough chips for a week." What have I done? <laughs> you know, like, and I like, I bow to no one in my love of chips, but it was too many fucking chips. You know. <laughs> And Scott, Scott, what, what are you, what are you doing? Are, are you still just too busy? Because you are very I'm busy. Mostly, I'm mostly working on my parenting. Um, right. I've, I've received a number of of, uh, of good pull quotes this week um, <laughs> from from reviewers. Um, Thomas Andrews, twelve, uh, says that I am quote the worst father ever. Um, Brilliant. And uh, and Kitty, fifteen, uh, just. Says, why would you do that? A lot. <laughs> so it's uh, it's, go, it's going well. Um, in my head, I'm working on two books, um, and I'm trying to decide what I want to do with them. And particularly because I'm also watching the Terror because I, I did love the book and the the, the wrecks of the Erebus and Terror feature in uh, a fantasy trilogy. I started writing once. Um, and I got about 30,000 words into it and, and abandoned it for various reasons. And I'm just thinking about picking it up again. Mm. That's, a, that's a good thing. We, I'm obviously a big fan of ships, as everybody knows. Um, you you uh, are, Jay. You've started something new, haven't you? I have started something new. Um, kind, in as much as maybe my evil twin finished <laughs> off the second book. Uh, it, in what he's doing and sat down and then I sat down to to write something new and I wrote some of it and then maybe my evil twin started writing the third book what he's so doing on, it's That's like it's like it's easier. like the documentary version of the dark half man it's getting scary man it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really weird thing with starting a new fan, fantasy thing because it's quite involved and in complex and, and I've I'm cheating a bit because I've already written four chapters that existed that I'd sent to my publisher um, to see if they'd like it. I might have said too much there. Just ignore <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> but 
I have a friend called Matt, uh, and I meet up with Matt, and I used to play badminton with him before all the COVID stuff. And Matt lets me talk at him about what I'm going to do and bounce stuff off him. And I've not had that for this book, and I'm really missing it. And it's really weird, and I'm kind of, I'm not, mm. I don't feel I'm in that place where I know everything well enough to just go at it. Though when I actually sit down and write, I can write. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, I've not, I'm just not, I've not committed. I think there's a moment when, you, when you're writing something where you commit to something and then you're yeah. doing it. And yeah. I've not reached that, that point yet. So I do know how long my deadlines are for this book, so I'm not that worried. I think I, I'm starting to think long deadlines are the devil, though. I'm they starting. To yeah. think, I'm actually starting to think that they are the worst thing in the world. I'm actually starting to yeah. think nearly impossibly short deadlines are actually the only good kind. I um, agree. And that's, you know, but then I'm, you know, you're talking to someone who's spending quite a lot of time at the moment <laughs> paying a stranger to talk to them about figuring out what to do about their self-worth issues. So maybe that's got something <laughs> to do with it as well. Who knows? Uh, that may be a factor. But yeah, I, I'm really, yeah, not not having not having deadlines has has absolutely hammered my productivity over the last year. And I'm, it's only now that I'm starting to set myself very, very hard deadlines that so I'm getting stuff done. I mean, that, that non-fiction piece was great. It was like, you've got a week to write it if you want us to edit it properly or a fortnight if you just want a copy edit. I was like, no, no, edit it properly, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> so I had to get it both, done by... Both my, head, both my headphones and my computer are telling me they're about to shut down. Oh, well, there you oh. go. Well, I on that... excuse myself, Jen. On that low-powered okay. bombshell, I think yeah. we'll call it a night. It's it's 10 o'clock, to yeah. be fair. It is. It's been, it's, been a, it's been a lovely night and lovely chatting. And I'm looking oh. forward to next week when it's just actually the three of us. It'll be lovely just to just yeah. sort of... And since Make we're a proper nonsense. podcast now, I will I will get the ridiculously expensive microphone setup that I bought uh, a year ago, intending to start a podcast, and then never did. Out of storage, set it up, and uh, try and sound professional next week. Ooh, get me! I do quite like the fact that it sounds like you're coming in from the 1950s. No, I think that's quite cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can I can speak like this if you wish. Hello, this is London broadcasting. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Can you hear me, RJ? <laughs> I can. Is I that Andrews? <laughs> Children, Pip, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll see you uh, next week. Okay. Ta ta. Ta ta. Um, it has been lovely, everybody. Um, just to clarify, are we having a bonus right up list next week? No, no, no. It's a fortnight. It's always a fortnight. We're not doing one next yeah. week, are we? No. No, no, no. I just RJ saying, that... saying next week because he's RJ yeah. and he has I'm, no concept I'm... of linear time. Have you learned no, nothing, no. citizens of Rightopolis, no. by this point? I was, I was going to say, the thing about deadlines is I never <laughs> actually think about deadlines. I just write stuff. And I found, I'll tell you about going slightly mad when I didn't have any writing to do. Yeah, yeah, you did. I was, yeah. I was there over Christmas or something, and you had all like. After you'd finished yeah. your book, and your, your agent was like, take a break. And then after three yeah. days of emails, your agent was like, start writing again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I literally can't stop. So I'm, I'm doing it. I, I'm going to write. No, I'm not. RJ Dapp's going to write the next book he's doing because I'm meant to do three. Um, I would quite like to just, because I can speak about it now and I've not been able to. I might just very quickly tell people what they're about, what he's doing. Is that, can you wait? Can you stay around for a little bit, Kit? Just yeah, I, well, okay. I have to now. Yeah, um, the RJ Dark's books are the story of Malachite Jones, who has the worst name of anybody, and he was raised on a really rough council estate, so of course he was beaten up for his entire life. Um, and he's a pretend medium, so obviously his clients don't know that. And his best friend, who's a Sikh guy called Jackie Sinkatas, who's kind of a borderline psychopath, um, but he has a sense of morals and. They get involved with gangsters, and it's kind of a crime book in as much as they're absolutely hopeless and they just make a mess. But it's set on this estate that only exists in the head of me as a 13 year old. <laughs> and, and it was the place we were all scared of in the little suburb we lived in that doesn't actually exist and wasn't like that at all. And they're funny, I love them. Just, Joyous to write. They like sweets. Have you ever read the Spencer books? Spencer for Hire? I haven't. I don't think they're, so. They're, there's about 40 of them. 
Right. And and there um, Spencer's like a, an upstanding private eye, and he has his friend Hawk, who's a, a nutter and will kill you. Uh, and I love those books, and they're all basically the same. Um, and I, they were the only thing I could read for a year. I just read all forty, and it's kind of a British version of that, which is hard to carve guns in the same way. But um, right. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk about them a bit next week. I've got it off my chest now. Next fortnight and next, next for- fortnight. Next and program. Actually, and I'm being told that actually oh, we're completely wrong and it's not listener mailbag next fortnight. It's Luke Arnold, which I think is actually right. Oh, is it Luke Arnold next week? I oh, believe but it's not. Next, next fortnight. fortnight. Next fortnight, Kate. <laughs> it, it's Luke Arnold. I thought he was the 21st. Of... We've, well, maybe. Look, the, I've got him down for the fourth, but we'll. Look, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> We'll figure this out, okay? Yeah, yeah. I need to make changes to the... Look, it's either Luke Arnold in a fortnight or it's Luke Arnold in a month, and whichever one isn't that, it's going to be yeah. me, RJ, and Scott, okay? And the point... Look, yeah. here's the point. You've got a month's worth of fantastic material coming up, so yeah. don't worry about it, okay? You're in good hands. It's all going to be great. Chill. And then if you're going to suggest people for us to approach, please start suggesting some ladies. Actually, that... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, that's a really good point. Although I have I have got some suggestions already that we're, we're talking about, yeah. so hopefully. But yeah, yeah. We're going to try and get Priya Sharma, aren't we? Yeah, we absolutely are. Yeah. Because um, yeah. she's a phenomenon. And... Uh, and I will be installing a swear box for when Priya Sharma... <laughs> <laughs> she's <laughs> the best. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll definitely be, be trying to get Priya on. And I've seen that there's... Yeah, we'll actually... We will go through the... Uh, suggestion Ooh. box channel because there's a lot of names on there yeah anna smith spark would be she's mm. also amazing elizabeth may yeah there's some good names there yeah we'll we'll take a look we'll try and figure it out um we'll do that yeah yeah definitely but yeah but and but and keep the suggestions coming we're always happy to hear uh if there yes. are people you want us to try and talk to uh nice. um, St- stephen king isn't currently returning my calls but i figure you know give it another decade of nagging and maybe we'll get somewhere we might here. be able to get um joe Hill. You think? Oh my god! I might actually have a heart attack if we get Joe Hill on the show. I've got to be honest. That's. Uh... Well, I, I I kind of know his his partner. Okay, okay. I mean, I've uh, met I've met Joe at conventions, but I mean, that's the yeah. kind of like <laughs> I'm not going to mistake yeah. that for being friends or anything. Do you know what I mean? It's just like I he was very, he was very he... polite while I burbled at him. You know. Yeah, I think he quite likes doing stuff. So. I'll... Okay. I well, I, I mean, ask... wrong. Roll a dice, absolutely. Why not? I mean, that would be uh, that would be amazing. I I wouldn't yeah. be terribly articulate, but we could give it a go. Yeah, uh, well, but again, he, he's a man, which is not what we're at. We we were oh, overrun with men. We are, yes, yeah. we are, yes. Frankly, sick of the sight of them at this point. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. Good night, everybody. You probably should stop at this point, shouldn't we? You probably should, should stop. Um, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, Stephen yes. was brilliant. Um, yes. Scott was yes. brilliant. Um, none, none of the comments I made about men applied to Stephen. He was absolutely wonderful, and uh, it was a delight yeah. to have him, and hopefully he'll come back. But, yes, thank you all. Please, just go go to bed. Yeah, go to bed, <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye for now. Thanks for listening. Brightopolis records alternating Sundays via Discord. To take part in future shows, visit patreon.com forward slash Brightopolis podcast to find our server details. You can also support the show there in return for Discord perks and early access. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe and spread the word. Thanks again. Right up the list, right up the list, right up the list, we're not just gonna kid it. Right up the list, right up the list, right up the list, we're not just gonna kid, yeah.